Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I can hear you too. My, I, I finally have a second monitor set up so that I can have all the screens visible while I'm teaching. And that's going to be an improvement. I'll be able to see the chat window and all that. Okay. How was everybody's break? I hope you had a relaxing break. Pretty good. I mean, you, I'm sure you had work to do during the break too, just like I did. I ended up getting some lab work done at Stanford. Um, there's something called an electron microprobe down there that um, we use. I may have described this to you guys before, but it's um, when um, you take, it's basically like a, an electron beam that um, you use to analyze. I, yeah, I did. I showed you like a thin section of, I have my thin sections out here, a thin section of rock um, where it's like a 30 micron thick slice. So a millionth of a meter thick um, on a glass plate. And you use the electron beam to get the elemental composition. So like the chemistry that you can work out the mineral formula from. Um, so to identify minerals, to know exactly what the composition of the minerals is. And I actually, we, my grad students and, and my undergrads work on using some information like that to um, model the pressure and temperature conditions for the metamorphism of the rocks in deep in the crust. And for these, we happen, it happens to be from the Adirondack Mountains in New, upstate New York. Um, and these are like billion year old rocks that I'm sure I've mentioned. And um, so we're working out the history from a billion years ago. This is the, the working on the, the mountains that formed or the origin that formed um, when Pangaea was created originally. So um, yeah, it's kind of cool. It, it's so much older than the stuff in the Himalayas that I was working on before. That was only 50 million years old. Okay, um, right. So everybody took the exam at this point and I saw that the scores were a lot better and I was really happy to see that. So I hope you guys are feeling um, pretty good about um, your exam. Would you tell me what you guys thought, either in the chat or just, you know, unmute yourself? What did you think about that exam? Did you feel better prepared or was the exam a lot easier than the first? I definitely thought it was a lot easier and I I thought, I thought I was a lot prepared as well because I know that it was um, better, um, as you said, it was like connected with the other quizzes as well. That's why I felt a little bit more prepared. Okay, and, good. And um, I know it also connected a little bit with labs, a labs as well. So yeah, that's why I good. just felt a little bit more prepared. Yeah, so as you point out, Michael, um, yeah, the questions were sim very similar. In some cases, they were probably even the same questions, uh, but I did change many of them uh, from, those are the quizzes from the online textbook and um, those mini quizzes that are within the text and that, that are also part of your online quizzes. So if you did the quizzes on iLearn to prepare, for the exam then, and you paid attention to like correct, incorrect answers and understood what you were doing, then it did probably feel like a pretty easy exam. Um, so yeah, I, I that's good. That's good. A, 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 a pattern of improvement is fantastic. Okay, so if um, if you've got questions about 
those quizzes. I guess those all those quizzes on iLearn are still open for you. And so that means you could even go back and look at, take the quiz. You could look at those quiz questions again if you wanted to, to understand uh, what you did wrong on a particular question. But if anyone has anything they need to discuss with me about the exam, please do send me an email or let me, you know, stay after class and we'll talk. Okay, so, um, Today, I have, I'm just looking at iLearn. Um, I wonder if I can share, let me try to share my entire desktop. And I wonder if that is gonna let you see both monitors. Can you see this window? The uh, Can you see iLearn right now? No. No, you cannot. What do you guys see? Do you guys see um, the Zoom window and the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So if you want to see iLearn, then I've got to drag this over here. Okay. Now you should be able to see iLearn. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Now I understand how it works. Okay. So um, shockingly a little bit, and I knew this was going to happen, but the end of the semester is upon us we have only two weeks of classes left and then it's final finals week. So um, we have a number of topics to cover and not a lot of time to do so. What I've done today is put together some slides on mass wasting or mass movements like landslides, rock falls, creep, other such issues. And I've um, also brought in some more of those quiz type slides. So we'll go a little bit slower. We'll learn it bit by bit. And then I'll ask you questions during the course of the lecture. So get ready to either um, announce your answer or put it in the chat window. We'll use it like that. There's, I think there's a, a very clumsy way you can like do a poll ahead of time if I set if I set it up in Zoom ahead of class, then I could do this easier where you guys could actually select a choice, but that would take a huge amount of time. So we're just gonna use the chat window for this. Um, okay, so mass movements that comes, it, it deals with water too, because landslides happen when soil is saturated with water. So it happens after, rainfall um, it happens in places with just a lot of, with just more rainfall in general. And so their, their soils are, have water in them. Um, we need to, so we're gonna, I'm gonna discuss some uh, groundwater, surface water, like rivers um, and some groundwater issues. So we'll talk about aquifers and aquacludes. And I think maybe the lab that we'll do, I haven't decided on the lab yet. Um, I think we're gonna do one that is, looks at pollution and how pollution spreads. And so you'll, you'll figure out where a contaminated well is located in a community. So I thought that might be um, enjoyable. And what I'd like to tr try to do this week actually is to spend time on Thursday in class. Instead of me lecturing, I wanted you to try to learn from each other but in the course of doing the lab. So I'm gonna put you into breakout groups, maybe like of fives, depends on how many students show up on Thursday. Um, four or five students if I can get in a group where you guys can stay in class like we do it every Thursday, but work on your lab and have other people to bounce ideas off of. Like, hey, do you understand this question? What did you get for that? What do you think this means? You know, that kind of stuff. And instead of doing the labs on your own. And I just kind of want to test how that goes 
because we've only got a couple of semester, a couple of weeks left. I want to see how that works. If you guys like that better than working on the labs solo, um, so we're going to give that a shot on Thursday, and that means um, I'm probably going to record a lecture on one of these topics for you to watch asynchronously. So instead of doing your labs on your own, on your own time um, and listening to lecture in class, I'm gonna flip it and we're gonna do lab in, on Thursday and then you're gonna watch the lecture asynchronously. Uh, so look out for those on iLearn, please. Um, so I hope we'll have two shortish labs. Um, so one this week, one next week, um, but I don't want anything to run over into finals week. So um, depending on what I choose and how long I think it'll take you, um, that's what I'm gonna base that on. But I'm gonna make sure everything is submitted by the end of next week. Okay, so nothing lingering into finals. <clears throat> I want you to be able to study for the, for the exam. So this will be the third exam, right? Um, uh, that you take during final exam week. And that's going to cover coastlines, this mass wasting, water, the groundwater and like contamination, environmental problems like that, that'll be part of the lab. And then next week, I hope it'll be deserts and glaciers, like the opposite ends of things, the hot and the cold aspects. And we'll just, I'll just hit the highlights on those things. Okay, so that's what the plan is. I'm gonna move this out of the way. Are there any questions about how that's gonna go the rest of the semester? Okay, good. So let me just get this open here. So I wonder, I wonder if this will work. I'm gonna try to, you know, this wasn't working before, but I just wanna see now that I've got the second monitor set up, if I put it in slideshow mode, if that's gonna work. Let's see, I don't know what this means. It's asking me, that's weird, okay. Oh, it was a movie that's linked. Okay. Can you see the 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 one slide? Or do you see yes. a split screen? There's like a whole screen with next slide and the current slide. Oh, so you see a, a black slide that says mass movements and then one that's an illustration. Yes. Oh, okay. That's less good. I think I'm gonna take take it out of that mode again. Okay, we're going to go back and just use what we've been using and do it like this. I wish it was easier to control like what Zoom showed and what, oh well, this works too. Okay, so the kinds of things that we're going to talk about in terms of mass movements, and I'm using different terms. I, get, uh, I can't remember what the chapter is called. I didn't get the, the list of learning outcomes either up here. It will be there by this afternoon. Um, but as far as like mass movements, it brings into play like some tectonics. So earthquakes can trigger mass movements. And we also get topography because of tectonics. So the collisional tectonics that we had along the coast, right, um, created the Sierra Nevada and the transform fault that we've got, this the San Andreas fault, has that small component of uplift that gave us the coastal mountains here. And these mountains are very prone to landslides and such. So I'm gonna address how tectonics pl plays a hand in hand, goes hand in hand with landslides and, and other surface processes, okay? So this is, and it's also going to in, include talking about streams and how water helps to erode mountains and, and such. Okay, so this, uh, this is going to go back to looking at coastal California and why we have so much topography on our coast. Why do we have these like big cliffs on the beach? Um, and I'll use some examples from Hawaii. 
and how it's sinking and and maybe shrinking. Um, and then move into like, why does land, the land fail? Why do we get mass movements, rock falls and landslides? And then talk about the factors that cause the landslides. And there's an example from Scenic Drive in, in Santa Cruz Mountains. Okay. Um, you guys should know this already. This should look like old hat by now, I hope. So we have the, the one on the right, the image on the right is showing you the seismicity in California for almost 20 years. And you can see that there's a lot along the San Andreas Fault, right? So that's everything from, there's the Gulf of California down here. The San Andreas Fault starts here and winds its way east of LA, up central California, then kind of along the coast. This looks a little, offset even. Um, but anyway, so there's a, it, it's a zone of earthquakes, right? It's not a single fault, even though the San Andreas fault takes up most of the slip along the plate boundary, you know, in the Bay Area, it's particularly wide. The plate boundary is particularly wide because we've got the Hayward fault and the Calaveras fault and the Rogers Creek fault and all of those San Gregorio fault that's offshore. All of those are right lateral strike slip faults that help to accommodate the stresses between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. Um, and that's driving the North, the Pacific plate to the North relative to North America. And North America is moving to the South relative to the Pacific plate. Okay. And these are all relative motions, right? Even though like if you looked at a map showing the vectors of the motion for the Pacific plate, you would see that it's, I'm pointing to my Northwest, your Northwest. Uh, Pacific plate moves to the Northwest and well, the North American plate kind of moves in a similar direction. It's a little more easterly, sorry, westerly than the Pacific plate, but they're also moving at different different velocities. And so um, that's why I say the relative motion between the two plates is like that. Okay. Um, you know what, I realize I can't see you guys. So I'm gonna move your screen over here and that's gonna be awesome. Cause then I'll be able to see all your responses during the, these quiz questions. Okay, so um, there we have the San Andreas Fault. So that's a key factor in um, a lot of the things I'm going to show you today, uh, the, the, these tectonic plate boundaries. Um, I'm not going to, I don't think I have any examples from the Pacific Northwest, um, mostly coastal California. Okay. Um, so I've shown you, we didn't find, um, a thrust fault from Montera Beach. So I've shown you like um, images, and this is too close up to see that it's a thrust, but you can take this figure and use that as a reference. So in this case, this is the fault, and you can see there are two different rock types, right? They're different colors that indicate there's some difference. And they've there's there's been thrust motion. So the hanging wall upside of the fault, that's the left side, moved up relative to the foot wall side in this case, which moved down. And so they're both sedimentary rocks, but um, this one, yeah, they're just, they're just different composition. And there's a bit of granite down here actually. So you see it's labeled granite here, right there, that's some granite and the sediments are on top of it. Okay. So that's just what the, the coast looks like. And it's broken up by faults all, all throughout. And it's not just like strike slip style faulting. We're, there all, are a lot of thrust faults along the coast. And I've talked about others. Emma, can you get the door? Uh, yeah. um, so this is very common and it relates to the motion on the San Andreas. Chaos here. Okay. 
So, um, and again, this thrust motion, these thrust faults are why we have the coastal range here along the margin of California. Sorry, that was really distracting for me. <laughs> I hope it wasn't as much for you. Um, okay, so I showed you, I think it was last Thursday, in fact, not last last week, last Thursday was Thanksgiving. It was two Thursdays ago. Uh, I showed you, oh, get rid of this, because that's not right. Um, I showed you the wave cut platforms and the terraces, the ancient terraces that you can see that once were those wave cut plat platforms that are now uplifted along the coast. And here's a really nice example um, showing a really flat, um, a probably 80,000 or 100,000 year old wave cut platform that's been uplifted from down below. So this is essentially what was underwater, what was under this area where the waves break. But we've got these cliffs there instead. And so that means we've had uplift over time. And I showed you even a sequence of like four, um, four different wave cut platforms that get more and more eroded as you move up the hill. Okay. Um, I already said this actually, I got ahead of myself. So I, I, I mentioned that this is gonna come into the, the amounts, the velocities or the rates that these faults move will come into play. And so let's just talk about this, that the transform motion on all of the faults that I mentioned. So this entire plate boundary between the Pacific plate and the North American plate includes the San Gregorio, San Andreas, Hayward, Calaveras, there's the Rogers Creek, Green Valley, San Joaquin fault, all of those. And there are many more. The total motion between the two plates is about three and a half. Did you turn it on, Em? Oh my gosh. Three and a half centimeters a year. Did it? Okay, it's done. Um, it's about three and a half centimeters per year. And three and a half centimeters a year is the same thing as saying 35 millimeters per year. Oh my God. Emma, they're still knocking, honey. Oh my God, I can't keep leaving class. Well, did you just turn it on? I just turned it on. Okay, excuse me. She turned it on. It's okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> What's happening, you guys, is the, I told you there's construction here right now. And uh, the guys are working, but they're taking electricity from inside the house to operate all their tools and they keep tripping one of the, it's a power strip. And um, so they keep coming to say, hey, could you turn the power strip back on? Cause they lost power. So apologies for those interruptions, but that's what's happening. Okay, so back to where we were, three and a half centimeters. So that's probably about this much per year of total motion um, across these faults. So now that's, it's not all happening at once, right? In one large earthquake, like most of that slip is happening on the San Andreas Fault, but the others play an important role too. Okay. Um, okay, so the Point Reyes Peninsula, let me just point this out. Okay, so here's San Francisco, right? The San Andreas Fault comes, um, across from about 280. I told you it comes up the Crystal Springs Reservoir and the San Andreas Reservoir. That's it was named for the, the fault was named for the reservoir or that pond as it was then. Um, it comes up from about 280 where it parallels those reservoirs and then cuts across um, Skyline Boulevard and then uh, along a scarp that goes through daily, like Colma, Daly City, San Bruno, or San Bruno then Daly City, something like that. I don't know exactly where the, the city boundaries are, but it goes offshore at Muscle Rock, which is a, it's an open space that you can go visit. And I'll show you some images of the landslides there. 
and that's how this all ties into mass movements. And anyway, the San Andreas Fault comes up this um, depression and in, oh, and I'm gonna forget the name of this, is Tomales Bay, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tomales Bay is right here. Um, and so that low point is the place, it's created by the fault because as it moves, every earthquake, it's crushing and breaking up the rock that's in the fault zone. And so it erodes away more easily and you end up getting depressions um, where the fault lies. So that's one reason why th those reservoirs are where they are next to 280 and why Tomales Bay is right here. Um, and there are other, there's a big thrust fault here, the Point Reyes thrust fault that has helped to uplift this side of the, the San Andreas fault as it moves. Okay, keep going. Um, oh, this was, Karen is a, was a faculty member, she's retired, but she did this, Karen Grove, I should say. I should have added her last name. So Garen Grove and her students worked on these wave cut platforms over time. Karen was a sedimentologist and um, they worked, they used that information to calculate um, the rate in millimeters per year of the uplift of those wave cut terraces. So here's a problem for you. Um, the lowest terrace rose 80 meters in 80,000 years. Okay, so I want you to do a little quiz question. So what's the rate of uplift that's calculated from those marine terraces at Point Reyes? If we know that the first, that first wave cut platform that's been uplifted is 80 at 80 meters elevation. And we've dated that surface as being 80,000 years old. What is the rate of uplift, please? So do a calculation and they either vote for your choice, A, B, C, or D. Is it 0.1 millimeter per year, one millimeter a year, 10 millimeters a year, or a hundred millimeters a year? Okay, so now you have some, before you, dis, I mean, you can think, you can use a little bit of logic to check your answer, no matter what you have calculated here. Because I told you that the San Andreas Fault and all of those transform faults move three and a half centimeters per year or 35 millimeters per year of transform motion. And I've told you that that transform motion is a bigger component than the uplift. So th 35 millimeters a year should be a larger number than the answer to this question. Just using logic from what I've said. Okay, so what did you get for your answers? Please put it into the chat, A, B, C, or D. B, a millimeter per year. That's less than a 35 millimeters a year, that's for sure. Okay, so you guys calculated, hopefully you used your phone or I've only had a few votes. I'd like you to prove to yourself. So even if you're seeing the answers in the chat, do the calculation, divide 80 meters by 80,000 years. Oh, I should have said, um, just be careful like with your units, right? 80 meters versus we're, we're dealing with millimeters down here. So everyone is, nobody said anything except B. So <laughs> let's move forward. Okay, so here's the problem. Yes, B is correct, one millimeter a year. And you, you work it out like this. So 80 meters, and this is, when you do a calculation like this, you have to be really careful with your units. Always include your units. And when you write out your work, make sure you include your units in when you're transforming these numbers, because really you needed to make this number, turn this number into millimeters, right? So you needed to multiply by a thousand millimeters per meter to convert that to 80,000 millimeters per 80,000 years in order to get one millimeter per year. Okay, so that was the, the tricky step, I suppose. 
um, in the math was to convert the meters to millimeters. Okay, good. I'm glad. Um, I'm glad everybody zeroed in on that. Okay, so I showed you that this is what I was just talking. This is the uh, San Andreas and or I don't recognize I don't recognize this little peninsula. So I'm going to guess this is the San Andreas and not the uh, Crystal Springs Reservoir. Transform motion on this fault, on the San Andreas fault, is about 25 millimeters per year. So that's the component out of that 35 millimeters per year. So out of all the faults, the San Andreas is re responsible for 25 millimeters out of the 35 millimeters a year of motion between the Pacific and North American plates. And then you just prove to yourself that the, the coastal landforms are uplifting at a rate, uplifting along these thrust faults at a rate that is one millimeter per year or 0.1 centimeters per year. Okay, I should change this. So it would be easier to, to see like this if I put everything on the same line, a little less tricky. Let's see, let's do that. Ah, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Here, I'm just gonna move it down here. Very good. Okay, so you can see all the blah, blah, blah. There we go. That's what I wanted you to see. Just so that it's obvious to everybody how you go from millimeters to centimeters and vice versa. Okay, good. So the vertical component is smaller than the transform component. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so the studies of those wave cut platforms tell us it's about a millimeter a year of uplift compared to 25 millimeters a year transform motion on the San Andreas and 35 millimeters a year on all of the transform faults combined. Okay, good. Hope everybody's on the same page. So now that we know that, and maybe I did that a little too fast. Now that you know these numbers, maybe you should write these down. You need to know one millimeter a year for the uplift rate 25 millimeters a year for the San Andreas and 35 millimeters a year for all of the Bay Area faults. Now, please tell me, how do the rates of transform motion and the compression or the uplift compare at point raise, for example? So is uplift 10 times faster than the transform motion? Is it 25 times faster than transform motion? Or is transform motion 20, 10 times faster than uplift? Or is 10, transform motion 25 times faster than uplift? So please do a bit of math, look at those numbers. Either do some math or just estimate using those numbers. So I'm gonna go back. So your choices are A, B, C, or D, 10 times or 20 times faster. So here are the numbers again. So this 2.5 centimeters equals 25 millimeters. 3.5 centimeters equals 35 millimeters. Now tell me, how do they relate? Is transform motion 25 times greater than uplift or is uplift greater 25 times greater than the transform motion? Okay, so which answer do you have? Please, I'm gonna, wait, can I clear these? I guess I can't. Please vote again. What is your, your vote on this one? Maybe you guys were voting. Sorry, can you go back? I, I didn't have the chance you to really numbers. Dig digest sure. those numbers. I was trying to write them down. Here you go. So uplift rate is one millimeter a year. The San Andreas moves about 25 millimeters a year of transfer motion. And then the San Andreas, sorry, that's that's the San Andreas. And then all Bay Area faults is 35 millimeters per year. And then, um, and I, you know, it's included in centimeters to get you used to the idea of going back and forth. That's a good skill for you to have. Okay, so um, people are voting for B again, I see. And I'm going to use the timestamps to figure out which question you were answering. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we've got a bunch of Bs. I don't see, I see some Ds. Okay, 
transform motion. Okay, okay, so there's a controversy here. There are a bunch of Bs and a bunch of Ds. So everybody who answered B or D, think about this, is uplift 25 times faster than transform motion? Or is transform motion 20 times, 25 times faster than uplift? I'm gonna go back to those numbers. Uplift is, I'm gonna highlight this in a different color. Green, I'm gonna highlight this number. So um, 25 on the San Andreas, we'll use pink and then 35 on all Bay Area transform faults. We use a different color. Okay, so think about your answers, you guys. We have one millimeter a year uplift. So it's smaller than 25 millimeters a year of transform motion. So um, people who answered B, think about their answer a little bit, again, a little bit longer. Uplift is smaller than transform motion. It's only one millimeter versus 25 millimeters on the San Andreas. So the answer should be D. So good job, everybody who said D. Everyone who said B, just you got confused. You got to flip it. The transform motion is 25 times faster than the uplift. That makes sense because we've been talking about how the most of the motion on the, the San Andreas fault is strike slip and there's only a tiny component of uplift. It's actually 25 times more transform motion than uplift, okay? So the San Andreas fault is doing a lot of the work, um, but the evidence that that uplift is happening um, is, I think I'm missing a picture. Uh, hold on a second. That should be out of place. Uh oh. Oh no. Okay. I'm a little concerned that I just, I'm missing a couple of slides. Let me just go quickly to the slide sorter. Have a little break while I figure out where we are. Okay. I think I need to open up another presentation real quick. Grab something that I was using. And here we are. No, there wasn't anything missing. Okay. Um, tell you what. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to use that question simply as a way to get warmed up for for what we're the other things that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so we're going to look at an example from Kauai. Yeah, I think it's Kauai. Um, if anyone, I'm sure some of you have been to Hawaii, or if you haven't, maybe you've seen the movie Jurassic Park and have seen the those really steep, dramatic. Um, green mountains that lift out of the ocean. Um, so hopefully you've done either one. You've either been to Hawaii or you've seen a movie that uses Hawaii in images. So um, there's one coming up. But use your what you know and um, just think about uh, whether some islands might be growing and others might be shrinking and why that would be the case. So we've looked at Hawaii briefly. We've talked about the act of volcanism, right? And we've talked about how the chain of volcanoes gets older um, on the Pacific plate as you move um, away from that hotspot center. Those older islands are no longer active volcanically. And so they're not, they're, they've stopped growing. 
Um, and so what's going to happen to those islands after they after the Pacific plate moves over, you know, you've got the hot spot there. After the Pacific plate moves over the hot spot, what's going to happen to those islands? So you're, I'm going to show you some evidence that Kauai is old and very weathered. That's part of why you see these dramatic cliffs. Um, and I'm going to show you some evidence for submarine landslides. And we'll talk just briefly about other hazards that are associated with landslides like that. Okay. Um, so think about, I should have included, let me just see real quick if we can use that. I have a question coming up. I should have put in another slide here. Okay, you're gonna imagine so that I don't, you can Google this, Google a map of the Hawaiian islands if you need to. But remember, why don't you recall what you've done with plate tectonics and thinking about the motion of the Pacific plate over the Hawaiian islands, because you've done a lot of that in your labs and we've talked about it in lecture. But which islands are growing and which ones are shrinking? Or you might say sinking even. Um, are the islands, and remember there's a chain of islands that moves from the big island at the hot spot that's the furthest south. And then the chain grows to the, it moves to the Northwest. So let's just talk about the Hawaiian Islands. Forget the Emperor Island chain. The, the Hawaiian Islands moves to the Northwest. So big islands down here with, I'm make sure my hands are visible. So the big islands down here um, at the hot spot, and then the, the islands get older progressively as you move to the Northwest. So are the islands in the Northwest growing? Are the islands in the Southwest growing? There are no islands in the Northeast or Southeast. That would be over here and here. So I gave that one away. But tell me what you think. Are the Northwest islands growing or are the Southwest islands growing? You can use the chat to, to get to answer. Let's just exclude B and C, just consider A and D. Nobody? So I got one D, thank you, Kay. The Southwest Islands are growing. Did, Okay, Davino thinks D also. Do either of you want to volunteer why you're thinking that it's D? Um, if the plate motion is going to the Northwest, that means that um, they're moving away from the hot spot going in the Northwest. And so yeah. the ones that are in the Northwest aren't having that magma come up anymore. So they aren't growing anymore. And um, the ones that are in the Southwest, since they're over the hot spot, they're growing and erupting uh, magma still. Yes, correct. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the big island, certainly, anywhere there's active vol volcanoes, we can say that those islands are growing because the volcanism is adding, it's adding lava. You're literally growing the island. It was, I think it was just last year there was a huge eruption on the southeast side of the big island. And um, the island it literally created new island. So um, there's a new place to walk after all that lava cools. So it's literally growing, but not only is there new rock being added to the island to grow it that way. But the island is nice and it's up high because all of that heat on top of the, the hot spot is going to create a higher, it's gonna push those rocks that crust into a higher position. It's gonna be hot and buoyant. So it's gonna sit up higher and the water should be slightly shallower there compared to 
around the islands to the northwest because there's it's colder and it, it's sinking it's sinking down from that up that high spot and it's cooling off so it's they're sinking a little bit as part of the oceanic crust and they're not we're not being added to by new lava being produced right so what's happening there's erosion there's rainstorms all the time and that means there's going to be a lot of erosion what Hang on, what was she thinking? Sorry, I borrowed some of these slides from, and that's why the, the weird transition and that I didn't expect is I borrowed the set on Hawaii from um, Karen actually, Karen Grove. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I totally, I was trying to flip in my head and I totally had that wrong, I'm sorry. It was Northwest, Southeast, duh. I was saying Northwest, Southwest, which doesn't make any sense. It's Northwest, Southeast. So apologies, it should have been C, not D. So I should have excluded B and D. Sorry, 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 sorry. Let's look at this again and so I can explain. Okay, so North is to the top of the page. So this is, um, if you don't know your compass directions, you should learn them. Um, the hot spot is in the southeast side of this chain right here. And then this side is on the northwest side. So the west is to the left, east is to the right, north is to the top, south is to the bottom. So southeast is where the crust is hot and buoyant and where new lava is creating new crust. And then the, the islands that are to the Northwest are subsiding as that crust cools. And these websites are no longer good. Like, I don't know when she last did this. She retired a just a couple years ago. It feels like, uh, but um, I'm gonna just get rid of, uh-oh, what did I do? I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what I did. Um, okay, so those links are no good. So just to review, here it is written out. The Hawaiian Islands can, you know that it can be used to determine the direction and rate of plate motion of the Pacific plate across a hotspot that's fixed in one place, right? So we're seeing plate motion, the plate is moving to the Northwest and it's carrying those islands and that lava rock away with it. So that's why the islands are getting older to the Northwest. So the Pacific, the direction that the Pacific plate is moving is it's moving to the Northwest a lot parallel to this arrow. And how fast is it moving? Well, if you look at the ages for the different islands and this is really broad brush, this is really generic. We, Hawaii, obviously the newest rocks are zero years old. Um, but they go back to 0.8 million years. What is that? 800,000 years ago. Um, Maui is a half a million years to 1 million years old. Molokai, 1.25 to 2 million years old. And then to Kauai being the oldest of the main chain of islands at three to five and a half million years old. If you use those ages and then actual, the actual distances from the hotspot, you can calculate that the Pacific plate is moving 500 kilometers in 5 million years, which works out to about 10 centimeters a year. So that's about that much. Yeah, I suppose it's smaller than the width of my hand. So it's probably like this big. Okay. so. Um, that gives you another idea how fast these processes are are moving. Okay, we're, I promise we're going to get to the the actual images of Hawaii in a in a bit. They're here. Okay. Um, so, what is the evidence that we're going to see that Kauai is old and highly weathered? Um, Waimea Canyon is a famous canyon. If you've been to Kauai, you've probably seen Waimea Canyon. It's a thousand meters deep. They call it kind of like the Grand Canyon of Hawaii. It's got these red walls that 
the soils are really bright red from oxidation of the iron. Why is there iron in the soil? What is basalt made of? So think about um, basalt is mafic, right? It's a dark black or dark gray rock. Um, sometimes with olivine crystals in it or all the hunks of mantle rocks in it. But that black rock is full of iron and magnesium. And it's the iron that when it's exposed to the air gets oxidized into these red colors. And so the, the clays and the weathering products of the basalt are red. <clears throat> so the oldest places, the oldest islands have had just the surface, those rocks exposed to a lot of rain. Hawaii is one of the rainiest places in the world. Actually, well, Waimea Canyon is one of the rainiest places in the world because it's in the trade winds that come from the Northeast. So there's a lot of rain that happens. Let's see. Um, there's also evidence for, I feel like I'm working with, I still feel like I'm working without the slide that I need. I don't know where it went. Okay, give me two minutes. Just have a little break right now, a little mental break or just chill, check your phone or something. I'll call you back to attention as soon as I find out where the slide is. No, it must not be there. There it is. Where'd it go? I'm going to put this here. Oh, this. I'm getting there guys, almost done. <clears throat> I just wanna make sure that the next section doesn't um, have the same problem. So I'm just gonna double check that real quick before I get going again. It's looking good. Okay, I think we're good to go. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, 
let us continue. All righty. Thanks for your patience, you guys. <clears throat> I've literally been like so busy over the break with work and everything that um, with that lab work at Stanford and I'm trying to get a manuscript revised to publish it, this work that I've been doing on the Adirondack Mountains. Um, and it's been this process. It's like it's lasted more than two years. We've been trying to get trying to get it published. Um, but there's a lot of competition out there actually and to work on the same area. And uh, it can be really hard to get through the review process because other professional geologists are looking at your work, criticizing it, asking for more. And so it takes a long time. Anyway, so all of that work has been going on over the break. And it was, oh God, I didn't ask for my extension yet. <laughs> it was due on Wednesday. Um, but I need to get an extension so that we um, we can work on it a little bit longer before it's submitted. I think this time it's actually going to get published. So I'm not going to count my chickens before they're hatched. But um, uh, I think it'll. I think there'll I'll have some joy publishing joy soon. Okay, that just explains why this wasn't completely perfect before we got started. That's all. Yeah, I, it's funny. I even edited this slide. I must have accidentally deleted some stuff. So apologies about that. Stray, stray deletions. Okay, here we are. These are the images that I wanted you to see. So this is a picture of the Nepali coast. And so that's Pali over um, a famous bay in, on Oahu. And this is um, a slide scarp. So what you're seeing is this whole curved area right here in the mountainside. And this scoop shape to the mountains is the top or the head of a landslide. And if you look at the bathymetry, so the, the shape of the seafloor offshore, this, this beach and this scarp, this is called a, a landslide scarp or it's a scarp. Um, that's right. Well, there's two of them here actually. So which one has spelled? It must be this one because I'm just looking at the mountains and it looks like there are higher mountains here. So I'm guessing th these are those peaks. So there's a scoop shape here in, on, the bay, on the bay or maybe two of them actually. There's one, there's one and here are a couple more. But together, look at what's offshore. It looks like here's a trail of um, land that is slumped off the island and gone underwater, moved downhill underwater. And it's that looks like it's moved off to the right. And then this area looks like it has slumped off this direction and even gone out as far as here where these big lumps are. So I bet that, oops, sorry. I bet it even extended farther originally. And that's just what was left. So there have been some major massive rock falls and landslides over time to generate um, a, a landslide form or I mean we're seeing the evidence we're seeing the the body of the landslide down here and the toe of the the landslide the very tip of it out here so here's the scarp which is the head of the landslide here's the body in here and there's the toe down here for that one Here's a toe over here. Unclear whether this belongs to that, kind of looks like it. And then this belongs to this. So the toe of this landslide is here. Here's the body. And then here's the head or the scarp, maybe starting all the way up to the top. Okay, so this is um, massive amounts of debris and there's evidence on um, Oahu and Molokai. And it extends hundreds of kilometers, really? Debris extends hundreds of kilometers. That's impressive. That must mean that it's the fine, the finest material that spreads out that far. Um, that that's that's impressive. That's a lot of land. That's erosion, is what you're saying right there. So those are huge submarine landslides. Before I go to the next slide, I want you to think. Um, 
what other hazards could be associated? What other natural hazards could be associated with these giant landslides? Any ideas? What can happen if you have a giant hunk of earth like plop in the ocean? I'm trying to give you a hint right there. And Maybe tsunami? Yes, thank you. Waves? Exactly, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> you got the hint <laughs> or you figured it out or both. Um, yes. So when you have either a thrust fault, so vertical motion on a fault underwater or an underwater landslide or a, a slide that goes into the ocean, yes, it can generate a tsunami wave um, or tsunami waves that uh, that can spread out a long ways. And if th these are as big as they seem, when they happened, if they're really extending hundreds of kilometers, I'm guessing that was, that did generate a tsunami at the time. Okay, so um, the other one I was after was earthquakes. So we talked about earthquakes being involved. So number one, there are earthquakes associated with magmatism. So any, like, I don't think there's any activity on Oahu anymore. I think it's all ancient rock. Um, but there are still faults, you know, weak points in the crust that can slip. Uh, the crust is broken up all over the place. It's not as neat and tidy as you might think. And so earthquakes can happen just because of motion on, on a pre-existing fault, or it can happen because of magma movement. And the earth shaking can help to, to generate that landslide, um, particularly if the soil is saturated with water. And I, we already talked about how like the Waimea Canyon is one of the wettest places on earth. So that can all happen. Good. Um, I've talked about this place where muscle, okay, so this is mus the top of Muscle Rock. Is it State Park or just an open area? Muscle Rock is a rock that's right offshore. Um, but what we're looking at right here are, these are cliffs in Daly City. And this area in here used to have houses along the cliffs, but right where that person is, is just about where the San Andreas moves from off, on, on land where Daly City is to offshore, where it clips, it goes outside the Golden Gate and then it clips Point Reyes Peninsula and forms Tamales Bay, like I showed you earlier today. So this is just where it first goes offshore after being on land for a very long distance, like where it formed near the, the north end of the Gulf of California. It's been on land this entire time and here it goes offshore. So what happens when you have a major strike slip fault? Um, one that is taking up like two thirds I'll have to figure that to about 25 out of 35 millimeters per year of the slip between the two plates, there's massive landslides. And because we have this emergent coastline, we have steep topography, uplifted topography. So there are hills, right? And then you add hills and then you, you add a, a fault through all of those hills. The hills are already unstable. Um, I'm having a volume competition with my kids class, apparently. Oh, geez. Okay. Whatever. <clears throat> and these are also pretty weak rocks. So there's a lot of sedimentary rocks that, that aren't like sandstones. They're gray wackies. They're dirty sandstones that, that erode pretty easily. Um, so they're pretty young sediments. They're not super um, consolidated, which means they're not they're not dense and really well cemented together. Um, and all of that gets weakened by the faults and any motions on the fault. So um, this is the same cliff right here, but taken from a slightly different angle. And you can see that the, these folks here lost most of their backyards to these landslides. And this is ongoing. Um, 
it was the, most of this damage was done in the 1997, 98 um, uh, El Nino winter. So there was a huge amount of rain that year. And that's what contributed to these massive, massive landslides. And it, 17 houses were taken out from right in here, from between this point and up to those other houses up there, all in here where this guy was taken out because look at the land, it's all a mess. It's slumped and there was huge amount of just slumping and land motion at the surface. So they no longer had, their houses were probably destroyed by this um, because you can't just take a flat foundation and remove part of it, what's supporting it and not have damage to the structure. Uh, not only that, but the erosion is ongoing. And so they may have lost even part of the land underneath their house to this landslide. Okay, so here it is. Um, this was supposed to be part of an animation. So let me just move this out of the way since I can't do the, uh, the video. Okay, so here, check this out. Um, this is in Pacifica and I've showed you some other pictures um, from the same area. And it doesn't even look like this anymore. Most of these are gone now. I mean, frankly, it doesn't look like this. Look at this whole section. This was an area of collapse also in the same, and I know that these links are bad, during the 97-98 El Nino winter, um, there was a huge amount of erosion along the Pacific Cliffs too. And this is just south of um, Muscle Rock that I was just showing you. Uh, and look, you can see that the cliff has eroded away from beneath these houses. So in this case, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, in, in this case, this is wave action from the storms and all that undercutting the cliffs and causing the erosion. Okay, so um, the message there was, here, I'll put it down in this corner. Uh, and it continued. And so there was even more damage in 2009, 2010. That winter was another bad winter. Okay. But there are very good dog walking beaches down here now in Pacifica. So <laughs> maybe there was a good thing. Okay. So we talked. Um, we. Excuse me. So um, we've been talking about the mount, the uplift along the coast, and I've said a bunch of things about um, the San Andreas Fault and how much strike slip motion there is versus uplift, right? Versus the vertical motion, because strike slip motion is purely horizontal, but we have this small component of uplift. So answer this question, why is there a mountain range along the coast of California? Now I've already mentioned this, but let's see if you can pick out the right answer. A, the transform or strike slip faults produce large mountains. Or B, there is a small amount of compression and some thrust faults. Or C, most of the, the faults in California are thrust faults or D, it is a collisional plate boundary, the type that produces the largest mountains. So please either say your response or use the chat again to give me A, B, C, or D. What's the, what, what's the best answer? Oh, guys, wake up. <laughs> okay, there's Trevor with a B, all right. We got Kiana with a C. What else do you guys have? So one guess that there most of the faults are thrust faults, therefore uplift along the coast, or B, there's a small amount of compression in some faults. We have more Bs, okay. Bs are winning so far. Keep volunteering. I want to hear your opinion too. I know there are more than five people in this class right now. 
In fact, how many of the, yeah, there's a bunch of you guys. Okay, I got another C, got some more Bs. Has everyone gotten a chance to put in their answer in the chat? So it's between B and C apparently. Okay. Drum roll. Let's go to the slide. B, there's a small amount of compression and some thrust faults. I'm actually kind of surprised no one answered A because when I read that just now, all I could think of was what I've been telling you that there's a small component of uplift along the transform faults. So these strike slip faults shouldn't produce mountains, right? If they're horizontal motion, they shouldn't produce mountains, but there's this tiny component of uplift. So it's not purely strike slip. So the transforms do kind of produce the large mountains, but that's also expressed in B. There's a small amount of compression and there are some thrust faults in addition to that small component of uplift. So in this case, um, probably there's a larger component of uplift along the thrust faults than the vertical component of motion on the transform fault. That's what this suggests. So B is the correct answer. There's a small amount of compression and that's taken up on thrust faults or thrust faults are those low angle, low angle reverse faults, right? The thrust fault that moves material when you move material closer together, if you were to squeeze it or compress it in a collision zone. Okay, and that's because, right? We talked about two ways we can think about this. The, it's not purely strike slip that there's a tiny component. Here, I'll add it here even. There's um, about one millimeter, ah, uh, one millimeter per year of uplift along the San Andreas. Okay, so I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger so it's more readable. So there's a, even though there's 25 millimeters per year of strike slip motion, and I'll clarify that. Um, it's 25 millimeters per year. But, um, that's in addition to this one millimeter per year of uplift along the same fault, right? So it's mostly strike slip motion with a tiny component of uplift. And there are these thrust faults um, along, they're, they're in the South Bay, in San Jose, all along Los Gatos, Campbell, Santa Clara, Cupertino, all in there. If you're in the South Bay, you recognize some of those places. Um, anywhere there are hills, there are thrust faults in the South Bay. Up along the peninsula, across the Stanford campus, there are thrust faults where you rock uphill, walk uphill from one building to another near the quad. Um, places all over the place, all over the place. And including the coastal, like the wave cut platforms and the, the thrust faults that we see on the beaches even. I've used some of those photos in examples, but this, <clears throat> today we use the example of this, the point raised thrust fault offshore here. Okay. Muscle rock. Okay, so that is the same one. That is the same one. So these two are the ones that I could have deleted. Maybe I deleted the wrong set. That's what I did. Okay, so here we go again with Hawaii. All right, so it's a little mixed up, but let's roll with it. Which best explains the evidence that Kauai is the oldest Hawaiian island? Let me put this map up. Okay, here's Hawaii in the southeast, now that we've clarified that, and Kauai the oldest of the large islands in the Hawaiian chain. 
Kauai is down at this, is up at this northwestern end of chain of islands. So what evidence do we have? Wait, I went the wrong way. What evidence um, ex do we have that Kauai is the oldest Hawaiian island? Let's never mind the, the geochronology or the radiometric ages that we have that date the rocks, right? Let's look at these options. A, Kauai is the largest sized island. I'm not even, is that true? B, Kauai has been split in two by a huge landslide. Mm. C, Kauai is where lava is flowing into the sea. Does that explain it being old? And is that true? D, Kauai consists of highly weathered basalt. What do you think is the best answer there? Any volunteers? I'm seeing D. I think that's a good choice. I'm not gonna wait for everybody in this case. I see some Ds. Um, I think our answer was hidden here. Yes, I, I hinted at this earlier when I said we talked about the really red soils. Kauai consists of highly weathered basalt that's reddish from oxidation. And it's also got these, these really deeply eroded valleys like Waimea Canyon. This lecture certainly needs a picture of Waimea Canyon. So I will put one in to explain briefly on Thursday. Okay, where are we now? Um, which of the... Uh, I'm not going to bother with this one because this just it brings in like too many random things and we yeah let's just move on to um, this one. I showed you a video that looked a little bit like this and hopefully this will work. This is either the same oh it's not going to work shoot. Th this image is a still that looks very similar to um, a video that we saw where a guy's mailbox got taken out by all this stuff. Um, and I think that I showed this to you Tuesday, the last week we met. What kind of mass movement is this? Do you recall? Here are your choices. Is it a rock fall? Is it a rock slide? Is it an earth slump? Is it earth creep? Or is it a debris flow? And sorry, I can't play this, but imagine a, a river, a muddy river with a bunch of stuff in it, like rocks and bits of trees and soil and leaves and whatever, and somebody's mailbox. What do you call this? Oh, you're answering me. E. Okay. It could be called a lahar if, the vol if it was volcanically induced. But if this is just, if this was generated or this started because of rainstorms, you wouldn't call it a lahar. Lahar is specific to volcanic events. A lahar is a volcanic debris flow. And I see that other people are guessing E Debris flow, one person guesses a rock slide, okay. I mean, it had rocks in it, so why not? They're sliding along. Um, oh, trying to go to the next slide. I guess I have to use this. Where am I? I lost my place. Oh, way up there, Jesus, okay. This is a debris flow. And the lohar was a good guess because it's almost the same thing, except that, you know, what is included in it, it's like not got a lot of ash type material in it. It wasn't generated from melting glaciers or maybe not even melting snow. Um, but if it's just an ordinary sedimentary debris flow, um, you just say debris flow. It's a fast moving, uh, it's a fast moving river that's full of lots of the different material. Like I said, 
it could be litter, man-made materials, certainly soil, lots of water, um, clay, mud, trees, it breaks up trees, it breaks off tree branches and bushes like plants along the sides of the stream because now it's flooded, right? So the it's much higher than it was. So it's wiping out all the, the grassy green material that grew on the, the flanks of the river. Um, and it gives you a poorly sorted sediment, right? Okay, so this is so much different material, really not well sorted. And this is really common in the winter months after really intense rainfall. So it could be like, certainly like 100 year rainfall events, like really big storms. What kind of mass movement? Okay, so number one, you haven't, I haven't given, told you about this stuff yet. I hope that you had looked at the chapter in your textbook and even tried the quiz before you got here today. So if you're a little like wondering, like, wait a minute, I'm trying a different way of addressing the material. So we're, we're going to questions first instead of me like laying everything out. Let's just see how it goes. See what, what you think. Okay, so what kind of mass movement is this? Same list. Is this a rock fall, a rock slide, an earth slump, an earth creep, or a debris flow? Can we rule any of them out? Number one, start ruling them out. And I see some guesses of C, an earth slump. Okay, um, what do I see? I see a scarp. In fact, look at this crack right here where the grass is brown. I think maybe someone was driving there, but they're driving right along the very top. There's some fractures up at the top there where more land might move. And it's taken out this road. Look, the road drops down here. Here's some of it. <laughs> and then it jumps up here. And then you've got the toe of this thing. And it's taken trees with it. The trees are still standing, but they're not all vertical. Um, and then you've got all these fractures. So um, I'm seeing a bunch of C's, one B, or no, that B is left over. So C, or slump, great, you did a good job. This can be a slow process or it can be pretty fast. Kind of depends on how much water is in the soil. The slow process happens when it's wet, when the grain boundaries are coated, but not if they lose connection. If there's enough water that those grains in the soil can't touch each other anymore because they're full, the pore space is full of water, then it's going to be a fast process. Here's the, this is a famous um, landslide in, this, in Southern California. Um, and there's a nice documentary that I need to find for you, the, uh, uh, this Brooks Institute of Photography that's down in Ventura. Um, this Lock and Cheetah landslide was, it's giant. Look at, um, here's the neighborhood and look at where the landslide ends. The toe of it is down here. And here's the scarp that at the top, right? So there's always, in, in a lot of these landforms, not so much a debris flow, except for maybe where it started from originally, but in, in these things, like a, a slump or in a landslide, even maybe a rock fall, you see a, a, a curved or a scoop shaped scarp up at the top and that's true here. You can see it. I don't know which angle is better for you to imagine it. And um, you see the toe down here at the bottom. So material was removed from here and here it, it here's where it moved to. And so what you're seeing in this image here is the result of a flow. And this could have been like a debris flow that didn't move very far. It certainly didn't form a river. So it was, there was less water involved there, but enough for it to flow. And then over here, you've got evidence of slump. 
So you see these scarps that are just starting to form and you're getting pieces of earth that are just slumping a little bit. They're just, they can't, aren't quite supported well enough. And you see a bunch of cracks up here where there's gonna be future slumping and maybe even more landslide at some point. I'd say it looks like it could, I'd say I'd, I'd wanna move out of that neighborhood is what I'd say. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. All right, so here's a diagram. I'm gonna get rid of this, this is the wrong figure. Um, showing you the anatomy of an earth slump, all right? At the top, we've talked about cracks in the, in the surface here, that there's a main scarp up at the top at the head of the, of the slide or the slump. So the head is up here, the toe is down here. So you can think of it like head to toe. The toes are down here, or it kind of looks like toes right there. Um, so this is the foot and these are, this is the toe. Um, there are cracks that cut across the bottom there. And I think you can probably see those here. There are cracks here that cut across those transverse cracks. And you see um, other scarps that form that are smaller than that main scarp at the head. So those are the main components. Um, how about this one? I don't think that's underlined. That's not underlined, is it? No, it's not underlined. So just so you know. Okay, so what am I talking about here? This is a, 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 in land, this is in Argentina. And what kind of mass movement is this? We've got mountains up here. And then this is the mass movement. What do you call this one? I'm seeing guesses of B, rock slide. What do you guys think? I'm gonna guess that you're now gonna rule out debris flow because it doesn't look like this had very much water involved at all. I think we're in the rain shadow here, in fact. Um, it doesn't look like slump, like those images we've been seeing just in the last couple of slides. So let's narrow it down to rock fall or rock slide. What's the difference? Um, so you guys are guessing rock slide. Yeah, it's a rock slide. Um, it, and a slide because it's on a slope. It's not, uh, if there was a, a more vertical component to this where it was like rocks literally falling off of a cliff and landing at the bottom of the mount at the, at the foot of the cliff, then you might call it a rock fall. Good job. Okay, so where do these things happen? Where did like landslides, rock falls, debris flows in mountains? I think we're missing some text up here. <laughs> yeah, this is what you were supposed to see. Here we go. So this is the, a map of landslide incidence and susceptibility. Um, so the regions that are in red and orange are the highest, most highly susceptible to these mass movements um, compared to, well, just the tan color is nothing and the green would be like less susceptible. So green to less susceptible to red, most susceptible. And you notice that where it falls are in the Appalachian mountains, in the Sierra Nevada and along the coastal mountains in the Pacific, um, in the Colorado Plateau and some other high points in the Pacific Northwest. So yeah, uh, where there's, where there are mountains, so where there are high places that erosion and other processes are work and gravity is working on soil and rocks to try to bring it down to sea level. Okay, just to wrap it up. Um, let's wrap it up with just a few questions um, and then I'll let you go, okay? So why are there so few land, so sorry, I should have prefaced this with this. Here's a map showing California's landslide ha hazards. This is another incidence and susceptibility. What you see is there's some in the Sierra Nevada, some moderate landslide, maybe even some high landslide susceptibility, but most of this is along the coast. Um, Point Reyes, 
the the East Bay Hills stuff in Northern Moose, California, Peninsula, the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, so why? And this is around the grapevine, I guess. Why are there so few landslides in the Sierras compared to the coast? Is it A, there are few steep slopes there? B, the trees hold the land in place? C, the soil was removed by glaciers? Or D, there is no rain, only snow? What do you guys think, those of you who are left? Come on, have some, have, be brave, guess. Bs. Okay, wait, is that 1204? Yes, I see B, three Bs. A, okay, so we think maybe the trees are holding the land in place. Don't we have trees in the Santa Cruz Mountains? Um, A, the, there are few steep slopes there. Okay. Think about Yosemite as an example of the Sierra Nevada at the highest points. Do you recall seeing, what do you, what do you envision if you think of Half Dome in, or El Capitan in Yosemite? Do you see granite mountains, granite domes and granite cliffs? and trees. So um, what are we getting? I'm, so everybody is all over the place. <laughs> we've had somebody answer all of the above. So we've had a guess all over the place, guesses all over the place. So it does rain in the Sierra Nevada. The rain shadow is actually in Nevada. So once you cross over the high peaks, so on the east side of the Sierra Nevada, that would be dry. And so I would say there's no, there's very little rain. And so um, that helps on the eastern side. But let's, we're talking about the west, what's in this map. So I'm gonna end your pain. The soil was removed by glaciers. That's what I was trying to get you to envision with the, with Yosemite. You're seeing, um, yeah, exactly. There's a chat because now that I mentioned it, Yosemite is a lot of exposed rock. Exactly. There are a lot of rock falls in Yosemite Valley. It's, it's bare granite and it's been carved out by glaciers, right? There's no soil on, in a lot of those places. It's bare rock and it's for miles, you know, hundreds of square miles. So yeah, 20,000 years ago, the last glaciation um, the granite was basically scraped clean and um, there's nice fresh granite there now. So it's going to take a while to break that down and form new soils. Okay, uh, last question. Why is the hazard along the coast greater to the north in this case? So see the purple, this highest area of susceptibility is to the far northern part of California compared to the middle of California? Is it because there are more steep slopes up there? There are fewer trees, there is more soil, or there is more rain? Good, I see everybody's heading toward there's more rain and you're right. The Mendocino Coast, the Humboldt County, absolutely, there is more rain. So good job on that. Um, if we look at precipitation, this is the last slide. If we look at just precipitation in California, you see the highest amounts are in the, the northern, northwestern most part, the northernmost part of the Sierra Nevada. And there's much less to the in the south, obviously. It's warmer in Southern California, but we've got the deserts out there. Um, the Great Valley is pretty dry, but the Sierra Nevada are wet and the coastal mountains get, get a lot of rain too but this is by far the wettest. So, all right, good job. Um, I'm gonna ask you about what you thought about this class because it was different in form than usual again. Um, and apart from my mistakes with my slides, um, I'm gonna ask you what you thought on Thursday, okay? So if you hadn't read the chapter, I encourage you, please go look at that chapter, read about mass movements. I think it's chapter 10 and um, come back prepared and, and hopefully some of the water chapter too. Come back prepared Thursday. I want mostly to work on that lab and have you guys work in groups, okay? So it'll be a little bit different on Thursday too. All right, and to, um, 
I may post something in preparation to do before the lab later today. So just check, please check iLearn later Tuesday and, and or early Wednesday and see if there's anything that you need to do. It might just be a real short thing. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. See you Thursday. Thank you. I still have a question for you though. Okay. Um, on my lab for lab A, so it's still showing a zero. I, well, I meant if you turned it in late, I might not have graded it yet. Oh no, it's because like, remember it was the one where the two rows had a, where you didn't see like the other two rows for mm. the number in kits. I haven't gone back. I, I will yeah. do that again. Yeah, well, um, I fi I um, I fixed it like um, before break, and like I was just like fighting you just beforehand. Okay. okay. Well, I'll go. I'm gonna go back and and grade those any day now. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.